Okay, I uh, guess we can get started. Um, so I'll be talking about, I guess my, my, my official title is the security or insecurity of third-party iOS applications. I sometimes switch around. Uh, basically, the idea is that um, uh, what I'll be talking about is sort of the, well, I'll get to that in a second. First of all, who am I? My name's Ilya. I work for a company called uh, IOActive. Um, I, I was part of a uh, security research group called Netric, and I have a blog that I update once or twice a year. Um, so yeah, let's dive into what this talk is about and what it isn't about. Um, the talk is about common security issues that I've seen in third-party iOS applications. So iPad apps, iPhone apps that you know are written, not part of the OS, but written by third parties, right? Um, I'll cover uh, the common security issues that I've, I've seen or noticed, and then I'll try to um, present some mitigations or fixes for the issues that I, I've run across. Um, and I'll document how to exploit some of these in some cases. Um, what it isn't about is bugs in iOS itself. There's a fair number of, of um, iOS applications out there where people talk about the actual OS or how to jailbreak, those kind of things. I won't talk about that. Um, to some extent, I will cover um, shortcomings of some APIs in iOS. But again, that affects third-party stuff, not the OS itself. Um, the mobile app market exploded a couple of years ago, you know, when the iPhone came out and then you had Android and then all of a sudden, you know, you had hundreds of thousands of apps in, in these app stores written by all sorts of different developers and companies. Um, and I'd say about two, two and a half year, years ago, um, we had, we started getting um, customer demands for, for, from our customers and, and, and I would imagine other um, security companies would get similar demands um, to review the mobile apps, specifically uh, iOS apps. Um, and at the time, there was very little known about it, uh, security of iOS apps. Um, I've done uh, about you know, 20 or so in the last uh, two years. And basically, this presentation is sort of my, my collection of notes of what I've learned uh, in those two years. The common sort of issues I've seen among you know, a large set of iOS applications and, and things that I've seen iOS developers do wrong consistently. Um, yeah, so before we can dive into that, you know, let's, let's discuss the application environment for a second. Um, iOS apps, almost all of them are native applications. What that means is they're written in, in um, Objective-C, which is um, this sort of uh, offspring from uh, the C language. Um, it's, a, it's a strict C superset. What that means is that um, every valid piece of C code is a valid piece of Objective-C code. Um, it runs on iOS, which is basically um, sort of a port of macOS to the ARM CPU. I mean, there's a number of things that change, but essentially it's, it's macOS and an ARM CPU. Um, interesting, interesting thing about Objective-C is that um, they offer a bunch of classes and uh, methods and objects uh, to take care of a lot of low-level um, issues, um, such as you know, memory allocation, that kind of stuff. And we'll get back to, we'll get back to that part um, in a little while. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, transport security. Um, it, it, in, in iOS apps. Um, there are a large number of iOS apps that need to somehow securely communicate to uh, a backend server or a web service or you know, some kind of middleware. Um, they tend to use SSL for that. And the way you do that is um, you basically create a NSURL, NSURL um, connection uh, object. And you pass it just you know, a URL like you would do in your browser, HTTPS, colon, slash, slash. And then you know, all this magic happens behind your back, and SSL happens, and all, all this communication happens. Um, the thing is, there's a whole bunch of defaults in there that aren't quite as good as they should be. And so there's a list of default ciphers. And so if you just make this connection, you turn on a sniffer, um, you know, you, you'll see something like this in Wireshark. And then if you look at some of the ciphers, I mean, you'll have the, the, the standard ones that are good. But then you know, there, there's also a number of ciphers that, are, uh, that pretty much suck. Um, including, you know, um, export ciphers, you know, 40-bit export ciphers, that kind of stuff. This is not the kind of stuff that you want to have on, um, but it's there. Um, it's on by default. Um, there's no documented way to turn it off, and it's actually documented that there's no documented way to turn it off. Um, Apple, <laughs> Apple has a secure coding guideline, and in there, and I have to actually snip it here, they say, you know, if you use secure transport for iOS, um, secure transport programming, uh, uh, interface is not available, use the CF networking interface instead. Um, and CF networking does not allow you to change the cipher suits. Um, so the, the problem with, with iOS is that the OpenSL APIs themselves aren't exposed, and there are a set of classes built on top of them. 
and they're not granular enough. They don't expose large functions of um, SSL functionality to developers. Um, and I mean, I, I can see that being, you know, trying to make things easier on developers. Um, but something like allowing you to set a cipher suit would be, a, a, I think, would be a great thing to export uh, to users. Um, I think developers should be able to do that. At the present time, they can't, uh, which makes this kind of difficult because if you have the set of default weak cipher suits and you can't change it, then you can't really fix the issue. Um, but you can mitigate it. So you can say, I won't use Apple's, you know, baked in SSL library, and I'll take my own version of OpenSL, or I'll take, you know, there are some other SSL libraries that are built for uh, embedded stuff, like uh, uh, CYASL or Matrix SSL, and you could use those. Um, another note on this is, originally when I started doing these things, uh, this was in iOS 3 and iOS 4, um, and they had these weak ciphers. Um, since then, um, I think Apple took note of this, um, and for iOS 5 and 6, they removed the weak ciphers, which is a good thing, but it's still, you, don't, you still don't have the functionality. You can't add a cipher. You can't remove a cipher. It might be that, you know, they took out these weak ones, but tomorrow someone will find, you know, a, a vulnerability in one of the other cipher suits they expose, and you can't turn it off, right? Um, so things are better now than they were two years ago, but you still don't have the functionality that you want. So when I had that snippet of the uh, uh, OpenSL, uh, of the um, iOS uh, secure programming guide, um, that Dr. Nathan said um, that, you know, uh, transport, uh, the secure transport programming is not available, use CF network. And so I, I spent some time looking at CF network, um, and CF network also does allow you to set these cipher suits. Um, however, CF network does allow you to do a few other things with SSL. It allows you to say that you will allow expired, root, uh, uh, expired certs, it will allow you to say that you will allow um, expired roots, it will allow you to say that you will take any route. It will allow you to say that you don't validate the certificate chain. These are all things that are bad. They're off by default, um, but you can have code like you can add code like this in, in, in your app, and this is perfectly valid. This will pass the App Store, um, where you can say allow expired uh, certificates, allow expired root, allow any root, um, don't validate certificate chain. And if you have this piece of code, this piece in your, in your code, um, you're kind of screwed. Um, Luckily, this stuff is a non by default. Um, it takes a little bit of work for a developer to actually screw this up. Uh, but it happens because this is stuff you use for debugging, right? If I want to be able to sort of see my own SL, the, the content of my own SL traffic, uh, this is the easiest way to do it is to say, you know, I'll take any certain, you just manually your own connection for testing, and you get to see, you know, what the actual data looks like. Um, and so I've, I've had about two cases actually where people had this, this kind of code um, in their code. And it, there was a comment above saying, you know, debug only. Uh, but they were about to ship, and their retail version still had this thing on it. So, you know, you try to you raise this red flag and you say, you know, make sure you remove this code before you ship. Um, and, I mean, there was, a, I guess, a, a paper about SSL that came out a week or so ago, which sort of said the same thing where, you know, for the, for the browser, SSL is pretty good. But when you look at non-browser type stuff like iOS apps, um, these kind of things are quite common where people don't validate certificates. They don't... You know, they allow expired routes and that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is, this is I mean, very common, very much on topic. This stuff does happen. Um, it's good that it's not on by default, but too many people either have it on for debugging or for whatever reason and then forget to turn it off when they ship. Uh, so it's something that needs to be, if you're looking at an iOS app or if you're writing an iOS app, you need to keep this in mind. This is, you know, quite important stuff. Okay, um, moving on from there to uh, URL handlers. Um, so basically, um, when the iPhone came out initially, I guess the iPhone, when iPhone 2 came out, um, and we were all allowed to make applications for the iPhone, um, there was sort of this decision made at Apple where they said, um, we're not going to, we're going to have this very strict sandbox, and as part of the sandbox, we don't want apps talking to each other. And I mean, security-wise, that's kind of commendable to have these kind of very strict set of rules in place. Um, but it's a little bit too strict because sometimes developers want to have apps that talk to each other. Um, sometimes even, you know, you'll have apps from two different companies that will want to share, you know, some kind of data to have, you know, some kind of collaboration going on. Um, so this, this, this was, you know, way too strict and developers found a way around it. And what, what they did um, was basically, if you register your URL handler, anybody can call it. And so you can sort of use your URL handlers as an IPC mechanism between two apps. Um, initially, this was a hack found by developers. Uh, 
um, later on, and, and certainly if you go to uh, Apple's developer website now, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a common practice. It, it's now accepted as a standard way of doing this stuff. But it wasn't there initially, it was a hack. And now Apple has sort of embraced it and, and supports it. Um, the idea is quite simple. Any application can register a URL handler, uh, and then another app can call that URL handler. It's a very simple IPC mechanism. I believe it was f initially discovered or, or publicly documented by the people from Mobile Orchard. Um, if you go to that URL, they'll, you'll see the original post uh, about how to use URL handlers for IPC mechanism. Uh, basically, you, the way it works is if you're making an app, you have a, a plist which describes a, a bunch of uh, properties for your iOS app. And in that, you can say, I'm going to use a, pro uh, a URL handler, and my URL handler is going to be called, in this case, you know, uh, my protocol. Um, and then code-wise, basically, it's quite simple as well. You just define a callback called um, handle open URL right here. Um, and then the moment that URL handler gets called from anywhere, the OS sees it and says, oh, I know that's this particular application. I'll call that application and I'll call that handle open URL call back on that application. And this is all baked into iOS, the mechanism to do these things. Um, unforeseen consequences. Um, yeah, any web page can do that too. If, if you're browsing mobile so far, you go to a web page, all of a sudden, you know, this untrusted web page gets to call arbitrary applications. Um, on your iPhone and gets to pass it arbitrary arguments which the application will not pass and think thinks comes from another application. Um, this is kind of bad, uh, especially if you don't know about it and you're making this IPC mechanism and you go like, well, it's undocumented and I trust that the guy that calls me knows what he's doing so I don't need to validate anything. And all of a sudden, you know, you're parsing that you, stuff that you think is trusted that comes from the internet. Um, that's kind of bad. Um, so, I mean, that on itself is bad. Um, the other thing is, um, if you were to do this kind of attack, you would still need someone on their iPhone or iPad to browse a website and go to your website, and then only then do you get to write, you know, JavaScript or HTML that gets to call into these URL handlers. Wouldn't it be neat if you could find a trick that automatically allows anybody from, any, anybody from within, uh, from on, on your local LAN to just uh, call these URLs? It turns out that there's a way to do this. As of iOS 3, um, there's this Wi-Fi hotspot feature in, in uh, iPhones and, and iPads. And basically what that means is if you connect to a Wi-Fi network, the first thing they'll do is they'll go to www.apple.com. And if, they, if it comes back with a like, 302 response, some kind of redirect, um, iOS basically goes like, oh, well, this must be a Wi-Fi hotspot. I will, just, I will pop up a, a browser window for you, and I will render this hotspot Wi-Fi page. Um, this kind of looks like this. Um, and so basically, if, if you can abuse this in the sense that if you knock, so you, if you knock an iPhone or an iPad off the local network, um, they'll try to reconnect, and then you could forge the 302 that goes to Apple, and, and go, you know, 302 to my, le my local web server, and my local web server will host, you know, this uh, uh, a piece of uh, JavaScript code or HTML code that allows you to call into any URL handler. Um, so it's sort of a way where, you know, n you don't, you no longer have to trick someone into using mobile Safari. All that is required is for them to be on your network. Um, this feature is on by default. Uh, in, you can't turn it off in iOS 3, but as of iOS 4 and beyond, you can turn it off, but it's on by default. Um, so, since, so originally in iOS uh, 2, iOS 3, you know, this sort of hack was, um, was in, in, invented. And then uh, as of iOS 4.2, app, what Apple did was um, they gave you a new set of API to sort of better support the IPC mechanisms of the URL handler. Um, prior to that, you had to call handle open URL, and now there's another callback called open URL, which is a newer one, and I would recommend using that one, using open URL over handle open URL, um, for two reasons. Um, yeah, if you look at the documentation, you, get, you sort of get to, um, get to pass different arguments to open URL than handle open URL. Um, and the reason why I would recommend using open URL is because the API is much more elegant for IPC, uh, you don't. You no longer have to do sort of serialization for your arguments, because what you had to do with handle open URL was you had to sort of you had to form a URL and then do you know the question mark and then uh, you know key one equals value one ampersand key two and so so you have to serialize and deserialize all your arguments. Um, handle open URL allows you to basically um, uh, pass objects back and forth, and iOS will do all the serialization and deserialization for you. Uh, so that absolves you of, of all these sort of parsing errors that would come with serialization and deserialization. Um, that's one. Um, 
The second one is that um, the, when, when that open URL callback gets called, um, you get to see which application called you. You get to see their application ID. And that's interesting because you can now build a whitelist or a blacklist of apps that you're going to allow that, that get to send data to you. So if you're going to use open URL as a IPC mechanism, you can have a, a whitelist and say, these three iOS apps with these IDs, I know these, and they are allowed to talk to me, and I will take their data. And if you're, if you're not one of these three app IDs, then I'm just not going to take your data. Um, so it allows you to have sort of a whitelist of things, people that you want, or apps that you want to talk to, and no one else gets to talk to it. Um, so if you must do IPC on, on iOS apps, I would strongly urge using OpenURL over handle OpenURL. Moving on to web views. Um, web views are sort of a, uh, it's a class in, in iOS that allows you to embed a browser window into uh, your iOS app. And people use it for two ways. Obviously, first one is, you know, to use it as an actual browser, right? So you can browse and, and go see web pages and so forth. Um, but it's also commonly used not really as a browser, but sort of as a way to build up a GUI uh, for, for your iOS app because it's just, you know, it's, it's easy. If you have to build the actual iOS GUI, it's a little bit of effort. You have to fiddle with a few things, whereas if you just write HTML code, you know, that's fairly easy. Um, and obviously, if it runs HTML, it can do JavaScript, right? Um, and so it's basically more or less of, of, a, of, a win of a window. So let's first look at uh, UI web views used as a GUI elements. Um, those are vulnerable to attack, right? They're vulnerable to cross-site scripting. If you render, if you build up your HTML and you put, you know, stuff in there that comes from an untrusted source, that comes from network, piece of like a, a username that comes over network or something like that. And if you don't escape it properly, you are vulnerable to very trivial, very textbook cross-site scripting. So if, if an attack can uh, inject unescaped data in there, you get cross-site scripting. Um, now, this kind of cross-site scripting, I mean, it's the same functionally than if you were to do it for a web app, except there's no cookies to steal. There's no session you can take over. It's just, you know, local HTML in, in, in an iPhone app. So you would think it's not really all that exciting, um, except what a lot of developers will do is they will build, when, when they use a UI web view as a GUI, they'll build a JavaScript to Objective-C bridge. Um, now, by default, um, Apple has no support for a JavaScript to Objective-C bridge. Um, I'm pretty sure they sort of said, I think that, uh, my guess is that a a people at Apple said, we think that's a bad idea because of you know, security considerations. Um, and so what happened was, um, you have all of these sort of uh, developer forums online for iOS apps and probably Android as well. Um, and a bunch of people there basically said, we would like to have an Objective-C bridge. And if Apple doesn't provide one, we'll build one for you, and you can you can use this. Um, and the way this was done is, if you have a UI web view, you can define a callback call, should start loading with request. And what that means is, if, if you if you have the render HTML and there's any kind of link in there, and you click on it, um, it goes to this callback, and it's sort of it's kind of still it's, you get another URL back, and then you can deserialize that URL and sort of use that to implement a, a, a JavaScript to Objective C bridge. Um, this, it, it's different for, um, to compare to the URL handlers in the sense that the URL handler is global. It works for every app, for every window, for everything. Whereas for UI web view, the should start loading with request only works for that particular UI web view in that particular iOS app. So it, it's very much local and it can only be triggered if you have a cross-site scripting bug inside the UI web view. But once you do have a uh, cross-site scripting bug inside the UI web view and you get the should start loading with request, and there is an objective uh, uh, JavaScript to Objective C bridge. You have, you know, pretty much almost complete code execution. Um, once you have that, you know, the depending on what the URL handler implements, or, or depending on what this uh, should start loading with request handler implements, um, you can do all so all these things that are implemented there from within uh, JavaScript in, in a UI web view. Um, there, so as I mentioned earlier, there, there's a bunch of these uh, online communities for iOS development, and, and they'll have sample code. And a lot of the sample code basically does is, um, like, they'll take a JS call um, URL handler, and the first argument is uh, a method to call, and the second, up until the last argument, are arguments to pass to uh, to the method to call. Um, and this is one, and I found this um, on a bunch of these forums. This is pretty standard template code that was written by someone else where they go like, if you want to build a, a JavaScript object C bridge, do exactly this. And then, you know, if you, if you look at it, you know, there's a, it's a JS call URL handler. And then the first thing they do is they first uh, um, 
argument um, is, is the function, and then they go, you know, oh, we'll make a selector out of that function, and then we call it. Um, if, if you have this in the web view and there's cross site scripting in that web view, you now get to call any function in Objective C and get to pass it any argument that you would like, um, including, you know, pointers and that kind of stuff. So this can easily lead to complete code execution. Um, that's if you use it as a, as a GUI. Now, if you use it as a browser, um, there are still things you can do, or specifically, there is a large set of attack surface there that, w that isn't generally there in a normal desktop browser, for example. Um, it, it does a lot more than render HTML. Um, it can actually parse a very large set of uh, file formats, and it does it without user consent. So it's, you go to a web page, and automatically, you know, this thing can render a PDF file, or unzip a file, or render an Excel sheet, or render keynote files, or do PowerPoint, or do pages, or, you know, this, and I think there's a few I didn't even have on there. So it's a, an enormously large set of file parsers. Um, and one of the things we know about uh, uh, these file parsers is that, especially Word and Excel and PowerPoint, is that uh, parsing those things securely is nearly impossible. Everyone has screwed it up. I mean, I think Microsoft's had over 100 advisories for um, uh, Word, for Office parsing bugs. Um, Apple's now had a bunch of them, too, in, in these parsers. Um, so you know by just exposing all the stack surface, uh, zero click, without user interaction, that you are exposing a, a, an enormously large attack surface. Um, where there are bound to be many, many bugs. Um, so we know they're enormously difficult to, to parse, and the fact that there isn't user consent is very worrisome to me. Um, that's one. The second one is that um, these, what these parsers are, I mean, they're read-only in the sense that there are more conversions. So most of these basically get parsed, and then they get converted to HTML. Um, and what happens is they get converted to HTML, but they get rendered in the current DOM. So that HTML now becomes part of the website that hosts it. Um, so if any of these parsers have um, cross-site scripting issues, all of a sudden, you know, you, you sort of, you have a, um, uh, an Excel sheet or whatnot that allows you to have cross-site scripting in, you know, a website. Um, these are all Apple's APIs. This is all in proc. All this stuff is done by default. You can't turn it off. You can't go to you, you have a few and say, no, I don't want you to support Excel sheets. It, it's just not there. Um, I think, I mean, if it's on by default, that's fine if Apple wants to do it. But the fact that it, there's no feature that allows you to turn it off, I find that worrisome. Um, there's a few other uh, uh, things in there um, that it can do. For example, it, uh, it'll detect uh, phone numbers and turn them into sort of these telephone URL handlers. And if you click on them, you know, the phone comes up in, 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 uh, in the iPhone, for example. This particular feature you can turn off. And if you don't, if you don't need that, I would say turn it off. Uh, but that's, you know, only one small thing in the long list of attack surfaces that you can't turn off. Um, so the only mitigation, because you can't turn it off and because it's on by default, um, the only mitigation that I could come up with is to um, render out of proc, to not use a web view. So, for example, the, the Facebook app has a thing where if you click on a link, they'll have their own UI web view that comes up, which is a browser, and renders stuff, right? And then you have all the attack surface, which is within your own... Um, iOS app. Um, and so the, the only mitigation I see there is to not, ren to not do that. It's if you need to have a piece of HTML, is to call out to Safari and let Safari render it. Um, it doesn't fix any problem. It just sort of shifts the blame, right? If somebody's going to exploit it, um, they'll, get to exploit, they'll get to exploit Safari and not your app. Um, it, it's not great, but it, it's the best you can do um, within what the iPhone has to offer you. That's what I, at least I think that's the best thing you can do. Um, so it's sort of, the, it doesn't fix any problem, but it sort of says, at least I won't be vulnerable, but it'll be Safari. Um, one, something that's fairly similar to um, these, these um, the attack surface and web views or the, what they call UI image classes. And what you want to discuss is sort of the, it's a general image class in, in that it supports a, a very long list of um, images and, and, and it'll parse all of them. If you, you just put it to a link and it'll parse them, including all of these. And then there's some extensions to, um, general extensions to some of these formats like EXIF and ICC. It'll parse all of this stuff too as long as you point it to something. Um, again, that is enormous attack surface. Um, and there is no way to say, go to your image class and say, hey, the link I'm going to give you, 
is a is a ping file, and you you should only parse it as a ping file. Um, it'll just you, you can send it something and say assume it's a ping file, and really it's you know a bitmap file where you where you just happen to know that there's a, a, a bug in the bitmap parser inside of a the iOS APIs. Um, so the, the problem there is that the attack surface is just way too large for what you really want. Uh, I've come up with two possible. So you can't so you can't turn it off. It's on, it supports open by default. Uh, so there's no real fix, but I've come up with two workarounds that I, I think uh, you can do. Um, so one of the things UI image allows you to do is to use um, uh, what they call the uh, CG image reference, which is the core graphics library they use. Um, and in core graphics, is much more uh, granular, where you can say, um, op you know, only open this JPEG file, only open this ping file, only open you know a bitmap file. And if if you go to core graphics and you say open as a JPEG and it's a bitmap, Core Graphics will sort of bail out and say, yeah, I'm not doing that. Um, so what you could do is um, use Core Graphics to open the image, and then you get a Core Graphics uh, handle back, and that handle you can pass up to UI image, and then UI image will use that handle. Um, that's one of the ways to do it. Um, it's a little bit of effort because you have to sort of um, do Core Graphics to open the image instead of the UI image, uh, but it's not that much work. Um, the other thing you can do is sort of do your own little bit of validation before you pass things off to UI image. Usually the way it works with UI image is A, you give it a link to a piece of data, or B, you go fetch the piece of data, you put it in, in an NS data um, uh, uh, object, and then you pass that object to UI image. So you sort of put an intermediate step in there where you go fetch the data, you put it in NS data, and then before you pass that NS data object to UI image, you go look at the first um, X number of bytes of the format, it's called the magic bytes, and pretty much any file format, and certainly any uh, image format, the first X number of bytes tell you, hey, I'm a ping file, hey, I'm a JPEG file, hey, I'm a GIF uh, file. So for example, the, uh, these, uh, these four, because they're quite common, these sort of the, if they start with these number of bytes, you can be pretty damn sure it's a ping file. If it starts with these number of bytes, you can be pretty damn sure it's a GIF file. So you sort of um, at least try to close the attack surface where you say, you know, before I hand the stuff off to UI image, I at least know that it's a ping file and not anything else. Um, so it's a sort of, it's not really a bug, it's more you know, the trying the closing of enormous attack surface. Mm. One of the other things um, that was very common uh, that I've seen, and they're not, this isn't iOS specific, this is pretty much anything that uses any kind of web service or any kind of XML parsing, or, or a protocol where you send XML back and forth um, could be vulnerable to this. Um, but I've seen this in a lot of iOS apps as well. Which, I mean, a lot of iOS apps basically end up being the sort of lightweight client for a web service or middleware, and quite often they'll talk XML to each other. Um, and so you'll see these kind of XML injection attacks where um, you know, a piece of data is sent to the iOS client, and then the iOS client extracts a username or an attribute or whatever from there, and then it, it takes that piece of data and sends it back uh, to the service, and then, you know, when, when uh, forming the uh, request being sent to the server, they forget to do proper escaping of this piece of, of un untrusted data, and all of a sudden you get XML injection. Um, whether or not, how bad the XML injection is depends on what your protocol does, and, what the protocol does and, and what it allows you to do, um, but it, it would allow you to to basically inject you know entire pieces of XML um, into the um, uh, XML being sent in. Um, equally, the same thing for for HTML headers, um, and this is actually quite common. Where basically it's the same the same process where you take a piece of data that comes from the service, which is which you would consider untrusted, and then you would send it back in some form back to the server as an uh, an HTML header or an HTTP header. And then you forget to escape uh, things like next line, and that would allow you to have uh, header injections. Um, again, not iOS specific, um, but it, I've seen I've seen it uh, in a lot of iOS apps. So I figured it would be useful to have it, to have it in there. Um, so basically, this is a, a very simple example where you know, you, you extract a, a, a file name that someone gave you, and you put on your H, in your HTTP header, um, and you know you say uh, take the file name, and there's no escaping. You just Take the file name verbatim, you put it in there. And so if, if I can give you an untrusted file name, I basically put a couple of next lines in there and arbitrarily inject um, HTTP headers and then also HTTP content. Um, and again, depending upon what the service um, actually supports, this may or may not be, you know, bad or not, right? 
It all depends upon the functionality the service exports to you. Uh, but this kind of header XML injection is rampant among iOS apps. Um, there are a few good things, though, uh, with regards to um, header injection. So iOS has some uh, URLs to set uh, to set headers. So if you don't just form them for verbatim, but you use the actual um, uh, APIs and objects for uh, um, HTTP headers, um, basically the way it works is that you you build up this NS uh, URL request or NS mutable URL request, and there there um, are two methods on there: add value and set value. Um, and basically, you give uh, a, a key and a, a key and a value, and it'll do validation of the the key and value. So if it detects that there's a next line in there, um, it won't actually send it through to the service side. Um, so it's not vulnerable to injection. I'm pretty happy about that. I'm, I think that's OK. It's not perfect in the sense that um, when these uh, uh, methods detect um, a next line, they'll fail silently. So if there's a next line in there, it won't send any request, but it won't be vulnerable to header injection either. Um, so if you care about it failing, um, you sort of have to do your own checks for that. Also, it's not documented, so it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, I mean, as a developer, I'd be pretty upset about this. As a security guy, I'm OK with it. Um, one of the things I've seen uh, that are incredibly common among iOS apps um, are, are format string bugs. Um, and, and this is pretty common to the C language type of things. Um, and so what I said earlier is that if, if you, so Objective-C is a strict superset of C. And that, which is native code, but Objective-C offers a whole bunch of uh, classes and objects that do all sorts of low-level stuff for you. And if you stick to the Objective-C classes and objects, you are not going to be vulnerable to stuff like buffer overflows and things like that. All of these low-level um, uh, security issues that you have in C are technically still there in Objective-C, but if you stick to Objective-C objects, you can mostly um, avoid having any kind of those issues. Uh, format string bug is sort of the exception, where you have these sort of low-level memory corruption bugs um, that um, the ob Objective-C doesn't really offer a good alternative for. In fact, Objective-C uh, offers format functions of themselves. Um, and I, I think the reason why there are so many format string bugs in Objective-C apps is because most developers that, that end up writing iOS apps don't have a strict C background, They'll probably come more from the web services and web app, you know, where they write Java code or PHP code or, or maybe C sharp. And they, they, they're not, they don't know the exact consequences of format string bugs or, or format string functions or the specifics of, of format string um, uh, functions. And, and so it's, it's, if you don't know exactly what, how a format string function works, then you're going to be, you're easily going to have uh, format string bugs. Um, so obviously, these forcing uh, functions can lead to forcing bugs. Um, and ev ev so I've done about 20 uh, reviews of iOS apps. And every single app I've looked at has had at least one format string bug. Um, so the, developer, the iOS developers don't seem to know about format string bugs. Um, the, the vulnerable or potentially vulnerable Objective-C methods um, are sort of, the, yeah, the list here. NS log being one of the most common. But any one of these, if you, if you use them the wrong way, you will have format string bugs. Um, since Objective-C object is uh, a C superset, you know, it still supports the C functions and format uh, functions. You know, printf, s and printf, f printf, all of those are there. Um, so a little note about exporting these format string bugs. Um, usually when you format, uh, when you try to export a format string bug, um, you would take advantage of the uh, percent %n um, a format specifier, which is the one that allows you to pop a pointer from the stack and, and write some data to it. Um, and, and that totally works for um, for those for these um, C format functions. It doesn't work for these um, because these are Objective C specific uh, format functions, and the format um, specifier parser in these Objective C uh, format functions doesn't support percent n. So there's no percent n. Um, so when I stumbled upon this and I sort of found that there were all these format string bugs there, I was sort of wondering um, if there's no percent n, how bad is it? If you can't actually write to memory. Um, what, what can you still do? I mean, there's still percent %s, so you could leak memory. Um, you could crash uh, applications. But you couldn't actually get code execution. At least that's what I thought. And so what I did is I started looking at some of the Objective-C documentation. And they don't have percent %n, but they did add a new format specifier called percent %at sign. And if you look at the description, it says for the um, 
percent at sign uh, format specifier says objective C object printed as string return by description with local method if available or description uh, method otherwise also works with CF type objects returning result of the CF copy description function um, so what that basically means is um, if you call percent at sign what it it'll do is it'll pop a pointer from the stack it'll see it as an um, NS object and it'll call a function pointer on that NS object. Um, so while you don't get percent in anymore um, and you don't get to write to arbitrary uh, memory locations, what you get in return is you get to call arbitrary function pointers, which is equally bad and maybe even a little bit worse because you don't have to fill, out, fill around memory anymore. All you got to do is basically be like, hey, here, call this function. Um, it's not exactly as simple as that. I mean, it, it's almost as simple as that, but there's still some parsing involved in terms of the, some parsing and validation of the NS object stuff. Um, and so I started playing around with this um, in the uh, um, in the iOS emulator. So I have, I have some assembly in there, which is uh, Intel assembly, to sort of see how easy it really is to do to exploit one of these format string bugs uh, using percent at sign. Um, and so basically, you know, I, uh, I don't. don't that looks good. Um, this I made a very 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 trivial. Uh, 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 C application, you know, the main function, I give it an argument and basically um, I do this uh, uh, NS log thing here, which is clearly vulnerable to a format string bug, right? And, and this can be attacker controlled and you can, you have a format string bug right there. And so, you know, I run it in a, in a debugger and see what comes out. And clearly, you know, I, you know, I get, um, you know, BBB, percent X, which is the, the pop from the stack crap that was already there, percent at sign, and then clearly you can see it crashes on, you know, 0x6262, uh, 82. So it parsed some, popped something from the stack, and it parsed something, and it crashed on something in object message send. Um, and then, uh, yeah, basically crashed there, crashed on the uh, 0x6262, 68. So somewhere in there, parsed something, and then as of when it got from 62 to 6, uh, was it? to uh, 82, it crashed on something. Um, and I followed a bunch of these. It, it's all, it's very trivial assembly code, but I don't want to go over all of it. Uh, but I started following some of the assembly code and basically the parsing uh, of, of this data that gets popped from the stack. And if you go into it a little bit, basically, you end up, um, yeah, this is basically, this is the sort of, once you're inside parsing of this, uh, in this object, at some point there's a structure for the function pointer. Um, and once you go there, oops. You end up in this function where eventually, you know, a function pointer gets extracted and it gets just called. That's it. Um, this was all in. in I, I tested this stuff in, in the emulator, so I didn't actually do it on the phone. So it's not. Um, it's not ARM. Um, but from all I can tell is that things are, are fairly, fairly similar in in ARM than they are in iOS. The structures are, are pretty much the same, and so the parsing is uh, similar as well. Um, and, and so it, you have to kind of fill around with these things and you have to sort of build up a fake NS object stuff. And when I did all this stuff, I, so, I sort of said, you know, try to um, basically sort of compact things into itself. So you have a very tiny piece of structure, which really isn't an NS object at all, but for the purpose of these format functions, it resembles an NS object close enough that you can get code execution out of it. Um, and so when, when I sort of when I jumped through all these hoops, I came up with this, and it basically, if you if you have, have to write an exploit for this, and basically write a piece of C code, and, and if you fill out, just randomly fill out the structure, and then pass it on, and you have the you you, you pop the correct values from from, from the stack, um, this should basically jump to mm, the instruction pointer right here, um, more or less. Um, okay. Let's move away from forcing bugs. And um, oh, so when I s mentioned that um, about forcing bugs is that if you use Objective C and you stick to the Objective C um, classes, that you're mostly um, avoid having all these memory corruption bugs like uh, buffer overflows and, and, and those kind of things. Um, and that's true except for one particular uh, thing, which is binary protocol handling. Objective-C has all these great classes for stuff like uh, strings and integers and, and all sorts of, of things. But for binary data, all it has in is data, which is basically sort of a, a pointer to a class which says, here's a length, here's a blob of data, and that's it, right? So if, if you end up writing or reviewing uh, an iOS application that handles binary data, you're kind of stuck with that, and you have to fall back to C code. 
And once you start back going to C code, you have all these pointers which sign and unsign ints and, and, and pointers to data as and offsets and links and indexes in there. And you have to do all of these validation yourself. And you know, as we know for, from um, years of, of bugs in, in C and C++ code, is that this stuff is hard to do and that it almost, virtually everyone screws up binary protocol handling in C. And the same thing is true for iOS apps. If you do uh, binary protocol handling in Objective-C, you have to fall back to C. You have to, you have to write C-style binary protocol handlers. Um, and I haven't seen that many of them, but I've, I've seen a few, and they're all, I mean, they're terrible. They, they're riddled with bugs, basically. Um, so if you have to write a binary protocol handler for iOS, be very, very, very careful. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess, um, other issues that I, I've come across, and again, this isn't iOS specific, uh, but it, it, it affects iOS, um, is that you can have directory traversals. Um, I, iOS has a, a, a file APIs that are quite similar to Mac OS X. And, and so even, I mean, you're restricted to the sandbox, but the file system is still the file system. And, and um, you know, it, it's still a directory, a hierarchical directory structure that you get to use. Um, and for, um, for Objective-C, there's a class called NS File Manager that allows you to sort of, you know, traverse directories and open files and close files and so forth. Um, and so basically, um, a classic traversal, um, I've seen a, f a few of those uh, when you use NS File Manager, which is basically if you take a piece of user data and you, you use that as a file name, then all of a sudden, you know, you can use dot dot slash dot dot slash, reverse some of the directory and open a different file, or read or write a, a different file. Um, and and they, they, they happen. So this is something, if, if you're either auditing or writing an iOS app, something you need to look at uh, is directory traversal. Um, but what's really kind of cute about this stuff is that um, because you're using Objective-C and not really C, is that this, an, an NS string and a C string are not the same thing. So you, you, have, you can be vulnerable to a poison nullpy. So what that means is NS string is basically, it's a structure which says, uh, points to a piece of data and says, this is a string, and it has a, a length in there which says the string is this long, right? And so as long as you start using NS strings and use the um, uh, Objective-C classes, um, strings don't have to be null terminated. They can just be a blob of data that you d declare to be a string. Um, but when you do this with file handling and you pass in a string along, eventually it goes from Objective-C um, to some wrapper that goes to the kernel, which is written in C code. And the way, that, the, the, way the kernel works is that it doesn't know about NS strings and it just take, gets a, 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 a pointer of data and it, it goes up until the first null bytes it finds and says that's the string terminator. Um, so uh, Objective-C apps are incredibly vulnerable to poison null, uh, null bytes um, when you uh, try and do uh, uh, file handling. And so, there's, so if you take the, the previous example, this one, and then you go there and you say, well, you know, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to tag on dot extension so that whatever you do, it has to have this extension. Um, and then if you're the attacker, you basically go like, okay, that's fine, but then as my last character in, in the, the file in the, that I give you, I put a null byte in there. And a null byte is fine for NS, NS, uh, NS strings. NS string does not care about null bytes at all. Uh, but once it gets passed on the kernel, they'll see the null byte and it truncates the extension. The extension goes away. Um, so, uh, yeah, in iOS apps, um, you have to be quite careful for poison null bytes in, uh, when you're handling file names. Um, As a sort of a last thing I, I, I want to uh, cover is um, the XML parser uh, or the, the standard XML parser um, for iOS apps. Um, it's called NSXML parser. It, it's not terribly, I mean, it, it's not great security wise, but it ain't terribly bad either. Um, one of the things it does is by default it handles uh, DDTs, which is kind of bad and opens up a you know, like billion laughs attacks. Um, and there's no real way to turn off DDT parsing, which again isn't great. Um, they don't resolve external entities by default, which is good. It can be turned on if you really want it to. Um, so this is, it, it's not great, but it ain't bad either. Um, basically, the way you sort of do, if you, if you handle untrust XML, the way you fix that um, is basically by implementing every DDT callout you can possibly have. So, you know, find an element with the class. I, I, I did a list here. Basically, there's six in, in, for NSXML bars that you can find. And the way you, you sort of work around this is you declare every single one of them. And if they ever get called, you just abort. You go like, I don't, this is an untrusted piece of XML. You're doing DDT. I don't trust that. You know, fail, right? Um, that's, that's sort of how you fix it. Um, 
So it's not great, it's hairy, it's error prone, uh, but it's not terrible either. I would have preferred that NSXML had an, uh, some kind of attribute where you could say, you know, don't do DDTs. It doesn't have that. Uh, but, I mean, the fix is basically to just implement all DDT parsers and say, you know, if this, if this DDT parser gets hit, um, then we just fail. Um, yeah, and I think I still have some time left, which is I went through the slide like faster than I thought, and this is pretty much what I had. Um, anybody have any questions? Okay, well, then uh, thank you all for listening. It's been uh, great talking here.